Well, hello. It's Andrew Doubleday here yet again. We're coming up to Sunday the 14th of March. And again, I've had concern expressed about the length of these homilies. They're really sermons. They're shorter than I would normally preach if I were preaching in a church. It seems that doesn't translate terribly well to the online format. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do the whole the whole sermon. It is a sermon, uh, and there'll be three sections to it, and I'll post the whole. But I'll also post the three separate sections, so that you can pick your own poison if uh, that's what you want, or if for the stout of heart, you can watch the whole thing. We're starting with the reading, which is John chapter three, verses fourteen through to twenty-one which involves part of Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, which I referred to in our last week's uh, message. And it involves also the Gospels commentary, which follows. It probably has what I would think is probably the most well-known and for many the most well-loved verse uh, in this part of the scripture, certainly from the part of the church where my roots are in. So let's read it. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not have sent his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in all that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. And this is part one. As I said, this passage contains that most love and perplexing verse, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. It's easy to get hooked up on the believing issue, that our eternal fate is determined on the basis of our willingness, or otherwise, to give mental assent to what seems to many as a fantastical proposition. I'll focus on the believing issue later. This proposition is that the cruel and brutal death of a man on a cross, who is claimed to be God's son, is sufficient to save the world, whatever that means, and deliver us from the consequences of our sin, with its attendant shame and guilt and the bondage to smallness in which it keeps us prisoner. And, as a result of our believing, this promises us an ending life. Hmm. It doesn't translate well in 2021, does it? Now, I accept that John 3.16 doesn't actually talk about dying on a cross. It doesn't specifically mention dying at all. Yet the context of verse 14, where it says that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That in that context, leaping to the conclusion that this is talking about Jesus' death on the cross, is not an unreasonable one. The difficulty is, and this is the first part of this message, that we can get so caught up in the awkwardness of the proposition that we miss what's behind it. It starts... For God so loved the world that he gave. Whatever we make of what follows, 
This needs to be the starting point and the underpinning principle that we keep in mind as we examine and discuss what's being said. It's God's love that is the motivating factor here. God's commitment to the world. God's commitment to each one of us. And it is expressed through the gift of his Son. Not only to die, but to be born. To live among us and to describe and show what life what life with God can look like. And then to die, we're told for us. To be buried, to rise from death, and to return to the eternal realm. A fantastical story to be sure. But what if it's true? Or at the very least pointing to a profound truth. Over the past few years I've been known to ask the question, did Jesus need to die for our sins? Or put it another way, did Jesus need to die so God could forgive us our sins? My answer, simple and clear, has become no. Now this may shock some of you and I invite you to hear me out. It's clear to me that God doesn't need an excuse or a reason to forgive. God can forgive any time that God chooses. Just looking through the Psalms is enough to tell me that this is the case. You can check out Psalm 103, for example, and I'm just going to quote a bit of it. Verses 10 to 14 puts it like this. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made. He remembers that we are dust. This was written hundreds of years before Jesus. Yet the psalmist clearly has the experience of God's forgiving love. God is not bound by some law that says that blood has to be spilt in order for forgiveness to flow. Or that someone, someone else perhaps, needs to pay. God can and does forgive sins because that's part of who God is. It's part of God's nature. God is love and forgiveness is consistent with a loving God. So then, if God didn't need Jesus to die, then why did he? And why do the scriptures seem to make such a big thing of it? I want to suggest that while God didn't need Jesus to die, we did. We needed him to. I was kind of clicked onto this a number of years ago when the weight of Romans chapter 5 verse 8 hit me. In the NIV it says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Now hear those words. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross is a demonstration of God's love. Hearing we are loved is often not enough. We can be told the words again and again and again. Yet it needs to be demonstrated in some way. In Lerner and Lowe's musical My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle at one point screams, Words, words, words. I'm so sick of words. If you're in love, show me. Love needs to be demonstrated, not just talked about. No matter how eloquently or poetic, it needs to be demonstrated. The cross then becomes a demonstration of God's commitment to humanity and the world. 
It's God saying, I love you so much, I'm willing to die for you. As you can see, while I no longer subscribe to the traditional concept of substitutionary atonement, I'm still strongly connected to these biblical roots. So that's part one. God bless you.